Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Enjoying your Mad ID experience? Was that a yes? All right. Have a little more coffee. It is early, but we have a great symposium for you today. I'm Debbie Goff, an infectious disease clinical pharmacist at The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, and I'll be moderating. We have um, really great speakers with hands-on experience. And I'm going to be excited to introduce uh, both Ryan Shields and Emily Wentz, who will be speaking on their experience with these products. I'm going to start. Here's where I work. It's a very big medical center. And, you know, we were one of the first to introduce rapid diagnostic tests. Carrie Bauer was my resident. It was her first research project. And... I look back at where we were and where we're at now. So it's really a new era in stewardship because never did I really think I'd have to be really skilled in diagnostics and microbiology, but they're our new best friend. They, you know, you can't do a stewardship program without microbiology. And the rapid diagnostic tests are game changers. So we're gonna do a little history lesson. Some of you are younger and new in your careers. But back in 2008 and 9, I will never forget the discussion from our microbiologist. Oh, there's this new rapid diagnostic test, but oh, it's so expensive. That was the end of the discussion. And I go, well, what does it do? Oh, you know, it tells you staph bacteremia in an hour differentiates MRSA from MSSA. I'm like, in one hour instead of the three days? And away we went. And that's how it started. So we, we brought in an instrument, and then I'll never for, and then we published the results in clinical infectious diseases. And John Bartlett, for those of you who are younger, may not know him. He's retired now, but he's a legend in infectious diseases. Was chair at Hopkins for 35 years, and a really amazing man. So he was getting the um, award at uh, it was actually ICAC back, back then for. Um, uh, you know, the Game Changer in Infectious Diseases Award, whatever it was called, but the most significant award. And he puts up this slide, um, Game Changers in Infectious Diseases, and, and puts our paper up there. Carrie and I were sitting there, and I will never forget her expression, like, oh my gosh, it's my residency research paper. I mean, what a great feeling. But to hear him, you know, 35 years into the career going, this is a game changer. Look at what we've accepted. You do micro, you send a culture, and you wait three or four days, and you might be on 100% wrong therapy, but we're okay with that. And I'll never forget that because it is game changing. And so, you know, you'd wait for the blood culture to grow and then in an hour or so, you'd have a result. So that was really um, impressive that in 2009, that was his opinion. This is one of the most significant changes in infectious diseases. Sure, we get a few new antibiotics along the way, but this is the diagnostic tool to empower us. What is my patient growing? And now it's our job to treat them with the right antibiotic, antifungal, whatever. So. Old school, draw the blood, send it to the micro lab. Generally, a blood culture takes 18 to 24 hours for growth. Tick, 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 tick. Three days later, you have MRSA, you have Pseudomonas aeruginosa. New way, rapid diagnostic test. Draw the blood, send it to the micro lab. 18 to 24 hours, you get your growth depending upon whose test you're using, one to three hours, pseudomonas, MRSA, MSSA, game-changing. So that's what we worked with. But then there's the Star Wars of game-changing. There's T2. Draw the blood, three hours, you know the result. You're not waiting for that growth. You're not sending it. You still send it to the micro lab. But they put it through this instrument, and in three hours, you have candida albicans. You have a gram negative. 
game changing. So the timeline keeps getting shorter and it really is game changing. So the challenge for stewardship is how do you determine whose blood goes through this machine? And that's the skill of a stewardship team. It's not up to the microbiologist to figure that out. They're not taking care of the patients. We are. And you work collaboratively to figure out this process. And that's what I'm excited about. We have two clinicians who have figured it out and are using this in their hospitals. So Ryan, I'm going to bring you up. Ryan Shields practices at UPMC. Their team was one of the first to publish the work on using T2 in canademia. And I've watched his work. They've got an amazing team of clinicians, but they're actually doing it and have published the results. And we look forward to having you describe your experience with T2. Thank you, Ryan. All right. So thank you, Dr. Goff. I was uh, hoping you'd read the title because I wanted to be nominated to having the longest title of the Mad ID presentations. Um, but today I want to talk to you about uh, using T2 Canada to diagnose invasive candidiasis. And I think as clinicians, we can all kind of relate to this problem of diagnosing invasive candidiasis. This is a disease that we see across a lot of different patient populations and many of our, particularly in our critically ill po populations. And so I want to start by kind of dissecting the issues and challenges in diagnosing this disease. And so there's a few major obstacles. Number one, it's that blood cultures take time to turn positive. Not only in invasive candidiasis do blood cultures generally turn positive very late in the disease process, but as Dr. Goff mentions, it takes time for these organisms to grow in blood cultures. And unlike bacteria that replicate very rapidly, Canada grows slower. So your median time to positivity is two to three days. And we know when you're waiting a couple days to identify Canada in a blood culture, that has an important impact on patient outcomes because it prevents our ability to promptly initiate antifungal therapy. There's been several landmark studies now that have shown us the longer you wait to start antifungal therapy among patients with candidemia, the worse their outcomes are. These are studies by Drs. Matt Morrell and Kevin Geary that show each day you wait to start antifungal therapy in patients with candidemia, the mortality rate goes up. Obstacle number two is that blood cultures are insensitive for diagnosing invasive candidiasis. And what I mean by that is you really have to understand the entire spectrum of this disease to understand why these blood cultures are insensitive. And so candidiasis really encompasses three different entities. Candidemia, which we often think of as having blood culture positive uh, disease, or this is patients that might have a central venous catheter and you can identify yeast from their blood cultures. On the other end of the spectrum, you see deep-seated candidiasis. These are generally our abdominal surgery patients that have ongoing repeat procedures, and we can find candida in their belly, and this causes disease. And then in the middle, you have this intersection of patients that have deep-seated candidiasis with or without candidemia. And what's important is if you look across the studies that have studied the spectrum of invasive candidiasis, is that these three entities all occur at about a third, among a third of patients with candidiasis. So we're not just diagnosing bloodstream disease or candidemia, we're trying to diagnose this entire spectrum across these three entities. And so if you compare that then to the sensitivity of blood cultures, our really only tool to identify Canada, you see that the sensitivity varies. For patients that have candidemia, blood cultures do relatively well. You can pick it up in a blood culture and you can identify the bug. But for patients that don't have candidemia, blood cultures work less well. And so this is one of the reasons then, if you combine these overall sensitivities of blood cultures, we know from studies and even autopsy studies that we're missing about 50% of the disease by standard blood cultures. So this missing 50% of invasive candidiasis is very important because these patients certainly aren't being treated appropriately with antifungal therapy. The next step is, well, can we identify these at-risk patients that were missing by blood cultures and can we do something differently? And so what I want to walk you through is kind of how we think about candidiasis overall. And, and so candidemia is something that we recognize as a very low incidence disease among very large patient populations. You think of every patient in your hospital for which gets a central venous catheter, they're at risk for candidemia. If they receive broad spectrum antibiotics, their risk goes up. But in general, this is a very low incidence disease among very large patient populations at risk. On the other hand of the spectrum, when we're talking about deep-seated candidiasis, this is a very high incidence disease among much more narrowly defined patient populations, like your abdominal surgery populations, perhaps. 
And so then you can take all these populations and think about patients in your hospital and assign some probability of risk for invasive candidiasis. And so we think of the incidence of candidemia across these patients, and you can assign them from low to moderate to even high risk of having candid candidemia or candidiasis. So again, your low risk patients might be any hospitalized patient in which you draw blood culture. You know that your chance of finding yeast or candida in that blood culture is less than 1%. On the highest end of the spectrum, then, we have patients that are at very high risk for invasive candidiasis. These might be patients that have severe or acute necrotizing pancreatitis or recurrent gastrointestinal leaks after surgery. And so what's important about stratifying patients according to their risk is our approach with antifungals depends on how high of a risk your patient has for candidiasis. On one end of the spectrum, these patients have a very low risk, and certainly it doesn't make sense to start antifungals across all of these patients because you have to start antifungals in 100 patients to find just one that might have candidiasis. On the other end of the spectrum, at the highest risk, these are patients that probably are best suited for prophylaxis. In fact, the literature shows once you find an incidence above 15%, these are patients that benefit from antifungal prophylaxis, where the prevalence of the disease is high enough that it makes sense to prophylax the entire population. But in the middle of these two populations is really our sweet spot for not only rapid diagnostics, but also these approaches for early antifungals with empiric or preemptive antifungals, there's patient populations at your hospital that have risks anywhere from 3 to 15% of invasive candidiasis, and these are the patients we have to try to identify in order to use rapid diagnostics more appropriately and start antifungals even sooner. So when to start and how do we do so? That's the big question that we want to try and answer today. There's lots of scores out there based on a number of different factors. There's been multi-center studies looking at risk factors for candidiasis, and even randomized controlled trials that have compared prophylaxis or preemptive approaches um, or in empiric antifungals. And the main theme of all of these studies is none of them have shown a mortality benefit. One of the reasons why is, again, we're trying to identify a very small population among very large populations at risk. So it's hard to know who should get antifungals and who shouldn't. And so when we think about these criteria that stratify risk based on risk factors in your patients, do they really work? And so this is how we actually got started with T2 Canada, is we did a very simple exercise. We looked across all of our patients in the ICU at UPMC that had candidemia. And we said, well, if we applied risk factors as defined by uh, the MSG criteria for prediction rules, or maybe even the Empiricus criteria, do, would they have identified our patients? And what you can see here is across three different ICUs, or if you look at all the patients combined, these risk scores only identified a quarter of patients with candidemia in our ICUs. So we're missing then three quarters of patients that had candidemia in our ICUs. Even worse, and what really drove our decision to do something um, better for our patients, is we saw that up to 17% of our patients were never even started on antifungals because they died before antifungals could be started. And you see here our median time to initiating antifungals was longer than two days, and our 30-day mortality rate was greater than 50%. So if you take these things together and maybe apply the same exercise at your hospital, you can recognize that patients in your ICUs that have candidemia aren't started generally on antifungals in, uh, very quickly, and their mortality rates are quite high. So can diagnostics help us? And so when I think of, well, what's the ideal diagnostic I need as a clinician to help my patients? These are things I'm thinking. I want a test that's going to be sensitive and specific for the target I'm looking for, in this case, Canada. Does it have a rapid turnaround time? And is it dependent upon the culture or growth of anything else? As we know from many of these new rapid diagnostic tests, many of them are contingent on having a blood, positive blood culture to initiate those testings. That's not the case for T2, and we'll show you that in just a minute. <clears throat> T2 also has the ability to identify the five major Canada species, and it has very useful positive and negative predictive values that can be used as a guide to antifungal therapy, and I'll show you how we've applied these at UPMC. So T2 Canada, what we know from the literature is this is a very sensitive and specific test for identifying Canada directly from whole blood. It identifies the five major species that you see there. And in general, <clears throat> no matter your hospital, this encompasses probably greater than 95% of all the candidiasis that you'll see from these five species. And it has a very rapid turnaround time of three to five hours. This is the T2 Canada instrument. It's the same instrument for T2 bacteria. It is now FDA cleared test from direct whole blood. So one of the important differentiators here is this is directly from whole blood. You're not waiting to send a blood culture or initiate testing. You draw four mLs of blood from your patient, you send it to the lab, and they initiate this test. This works through this magnetic resonance uh, technology that identifies these clusters of nanoparticles, 
and identifies these five major Canada species in as little as three to five hours. So the next consideration is, great, we have a new tool that we can use. This is fantastic. How do you use it? So there's really some important considerations, and I think this is probably one of the most important considerations I want to leave you with this morning, is that we think of these diagnostic tests as truly diagnostic, um, but they're not diagnosing the, the disease. They're not actually definitive diagnostics in that regard. It's actually better to think of these as biomarkers of the disease. And if you think of them as biomarkers, you can apply some Bayesian reasoning. Do they increase or decrease the probability of my patient having the disease or not? And so T2 Canada, I think of in the same way. And we can go all the way back to the 1970s and look at something known as the Fagan nomogram to know how to apply these kind of Bayesian biomarkers in our practices. The way this nomogram works is if you know something about the pretest likelihood of disease for your patient, you can use the performance of the test, the sensitivity and specificity of the test to calculate likelihood ratios. And then you can draw a line on this nomogram to know what the post-test probability of disease is. So if we have, for instance, a patient that has a 10% likelihood of candidiasis at the outset, and we assign the positive and negative likelihood ratios based on the performance, sensitivity, and specificity of T2, we know that a positive test then would give that patient a 50% post-test likelihood of having disease. 50% is certainly above our threshold of what we said 15% is, and that patient probably needs antifungal therapy sooner rather than later. On the other hand, the negative predictive value of T2 is also quite valuable. If you use the negative predictive value to calculate the post-test likelihood of disease here, a negative test shows you that your patient has a less than 1% chance of really having invasive candidiasis. The other thing that's important to recognize here is because these are Bayesian biomarkers, T2 should almost always be performed in parallel with blood cultures. Blood cultures are still the gold standard for diagnosing this disease, and so we can use T2 as an adjunct to blood cultures to identify patients much sooner. And certainly we know that this risk varies across populations. So I want to go back to this slide where we identify different patient populations and their risk for candidiasis. And now if we think of what T2 offers us, with the sensitivity and specificity of the test, we can calculate positive and negative likelihood ratios, or positive and negative predictive values. And when you do that, you can see here now that for the same patients without any diagnostic test that would have maybe a 3 to 15% chance of the disease, a positive test, defined here by our positive predictive value, these patients now have a 7 to 61% probability of the disease, and certainly pushes us above our threshold in which we want to initiate antifungal therapy. So this is our sweet spot. Now we have a test that can help us identify these patients that we were looking for and missing previously. So if you're a visual person like I am, we can, use, we can draw a graph that shows the same thing. The black line here represents the absence of any test where your pre and post test probability of disease is the same. But a positive test gives you a much higher probability of the disease and a negative test a much lower probability of disease. And I'll walk through a few examples of how we've used this at our center. So going back to the patient populations at risk, I think when you think about T2 Canada, one of the most important things you can do at your practice site is identify, well, what's the patient population at my hospital that can benefit from this test? And we did the same exercise at UPMC, and we wanted to start initially with our medical ICU patients that have host factors for canademia. So we were mostly looking at patients in our medicine ICU that had septic shock and were in, in our ICU for a number of days. We knew that from the literature, the patients with septic shock in our ICU certainly have a very high risk for mortality, and we know that canademia also is, a major, is implicated significantly in this high rate of mortality, and delaying antifungal therapy results in even higher rates of mortality. So here's our initial algorithm of how we've rolled out T2 Canada at UPMC. We again started with patients with septic shock, and we define this as having vasopressors on board for at least three hours where we know our pretest likelihood of disease is in this sweet spot, somewhere from 3 to 8%. We had teams order T2 Canada, which was restricted to our stewardship team. Only the stewardship team has approved this test at our center. This is not a test that we've let any physician order. It's only approved by stewardship which meet, for patients that meets very specific criteria. So clinicians then would order T2 Canada with blood cultures. They start antibiotics empirically. Uh, and, and this result then gets reported directly to our stewardship team. So not only does the stewardship team approve the test, but we have the result called back to our stewardship team so we can help uh, ICU physicians with initiating and guiding antifungal therapy. And so for a positive test then, we know that our positive predictive value bumps up to 20 to 40 percent. And positive tests, based on you get the species from T2 Canada, you can start whichever antifungal you like. We use caspofungin and fluconazole based on the species. 
And then we have to wait. And then you're generally waiting for blood cultures. Now keep in mind, you get this initial T2 result back in a couple of hours, where blood cultures, you're going to get results back a number of days later. And then you can stratify patients that might have blood culture disease to a standard course of antifungal treatment, or perhaps patients that have blood culture negative disease, but T2 positive for shorter courses. And we'll talk on, about it, that in a bit. On the other hand of the spectrum, certainly we know that most of these patients are going to have a negative test. And what a negative test does in our, in our hospital is because the negative predictive value is so high here, 99%, we feel comfortable then withholding antifungal therapies for these patients in septic shock. In most cases, shock resolves, and these patients never get started on antifungals. But if they have persistent shock, then we can retest them with T2 after usually 48 hours or longer. And we've also used this negative predictive value to discontinue antifungals that were started empirically. So we'll walk through a case, and this is a, a patient that we saw in January, and this is exactly her course, and it shows you kind of the power of T2 Canada in this setting. So this is a 74-year-old woman that came from an outside hospital. She had ARDS and septic shock secondary to pneumonia. Um, she initially went to the outside hospital and was started on azithromycin, piperacillin, tazobactam, and vancomycin. Her respiratory failure worsened and progressed, leading to her being intubated and sedated in the ICU. At the outside hospital, her blood cultures grew strep pneumo, which makes sense. Looks like this is somebody presenting with CAP. And so they changed her antibiotic regimen to ampicillin, sobactam, and azithromycin. She was later on hospital day three, after she was transferred to our hospital. This was her 10th day of hospitalization overall. She became febrile again. She became tachycardic and hypotensive and now required vasopressor support with norepinephrine. Um, per our protocol in the MICU, she met our criteria for having septic shock. So blood cultures in T2 Canada were ordered on January 30th at 11.09 a.m. Our stewardship team, a few hours later, received a call that T2 was positive for Canada albicans slash Canada tropicalis here, and we started her on caspofungin at 3.44 p.m. Four hours and 35 minutes after we sent blood cultures, this patient was started on antifungal therapy based on T2. If we were waiting for blood cultures, this would have been three or four or five days later. And in fact, her blood cultures did turn positive for Canada albicans on February 2nd in the afternoon, more than three days after we initially sent T2 and started her on caspofungin. So certainly a positive test helps you start antifungal therapy much sooner for these patients, but what about this negative test? How can you as antibiotic stewards use a negative test to guide antifungals at your hospital? Well, we've certainly used this approach as well. So a number of patients at our hospital, 25% of so of these septic shock patients get an initial dose of caspofungin or started on empiric antifungals. We've been able to discontinue antifungals with a negative T2 test, educating these teams about the high performance using a negative predictive value that there's a very low likelihood this patient has candidiasis because of what the T2 is telling us. So we've been able to discontinue antifungals in these 25% of patients that were empirically started on antifungals, uh, and we avoided antifungals in all other patients. And when we looked at what we were doing in our ICU before T2, or our pre-intervention here, we used a median of 26 days of caspofungin and fluconazole in this one ICU. After implementing T2, we've been able to cut this down significantly. We've cut our antifungal use almost in half to a median duration of 15 days. Um, and so certainly T2 has had an important impact not only on starting antifungal sooner, but also being able to do good antifungal stewardship and limit our inappropriate antifungal use in our ICU. Now, T2 Canada certainly does have important implications for antifungal stewardship. This is a single center study that was done in Italy. And really, they were trying to understand the performance of T2 in doing this study. And so they collected T2 as a research protocol and also sent blood cultures on patients. And what they found, and clinicians didn't receive these results, is only one patient had a positive blood culture. But importantly, in their hospital, empiric antifungals were continued for a median of seven days. So they had 46 patients in this study. Only one of them had canademia, but they all got empiric antifungals, and usually for at least a week. And I think many of us could recognize in our practices, once these empiric antifungals are started, it's hard to stop them unless you have other information. And generally, you're waiting for blood cultures. And this is a good example of how long antifungals get left on board. But the other thing that was important here is looking at the T2 results. They had four positive T2 results, but only one blood culture. And so this sets up an important question. What is the clinical significance of this phenomenon, where you're going to have a T2 positive result, but negative blood cultures? which we think of as, again, our definitive diagnostic. Well, fortunately for us, we have some clinical data now. This is the DIRECT2 study, which was led by some, invest my, some of my colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, Drs. Wynn and Clancy. And this was a multi-center study of patients that had canademia. 
So to be enrolled in this study, all patients had a positive blood culture with candida or had candidemia. And what they did is they repeated blood cultures, usually two to three days after, and at that repeat blood culture, they also sent T2 Canada at the same time to understand the performance of the test. And here's their major findings. They had 152 patients that were enrolled with candidemia. 69 of those patients, when they repeated blood cultures and sent T2, had a positive T2, uh, and 83 had a negative T2. But circled in the box are the, real, the main takeaways here. Among the patients that had blood culture repeat positives, there was 36 of them. T2 was positive in 32 out of 36, so a clinical sensitivity of about 90%, exactly what it was from the preclinical studies. But the other important part here is T2 identified 37 patients that were missed by companion blood culture. So it's also possible that T2 is going to identify more disease than you're going to find by just simply sending blood cultures alone, and that was the case here. And the major driver for this discordance was antifungal therapy. These patients, of course, were all started on antifungal therapy. Blood cultures quickly became negative, but T2 was positive and may have important prognostic implications then. So is T2 a good predictor of patient outcomes? We have a couple studies from Spain that suggest it is. Um, this one is where T2 was positive within the first five days of a blood culture, and they found that having a T2 positive was associated with complicated back to candidemia which they define as having septic metastases or death due to Canada. And the sensitivity of T2 was much greater than blood cultures or beta-D-glucan, other tests that we use to diagnose the disease. So T2 here predicted outcomes better than blood culture or beta-D-glucan. The same findings were repeated in a different study where baseline T2 after starting antifungal therapy was an independent predictor for worse outcomes. And so in fact, none of the patients that had good outcomes had positive T2 only patients that had bad outcomes had positive tests. So as antifungal stewards, again, maybe this tells us something, that a T2 positive test certainly probably predicts patients that have very severe disease and worse outcomes, but could a negative T2 test help us shorten durations of antifungal therapy and maybe identify lower risk patients that can get shorter durations? So if you put some of these data together, here's some of the highlights from our, our MICU pilot program. Uh, we've been able to successfully implement T2 in a very targeted population using a multidisciplinary approach that works through stewardship. We can initiate antifungals much sooner in patients than we could before, and we're also able to use the negative predictive value of the test to decrease empiric antifungal use. Um, so I just want to show that outside of UPMC or major medical centers, this test has a lot of value. Um, this is a, a study that was led by a couple of my co-colleagues here um, at a, a community health system where they showed many of the same benefits. The median time to initiate antifungal therapy is much sooner with T2. The median duration of empiric treatment was much shorter with T2. And they were also able to save money. And as antifungal stewards, uh, we all know that the bottom bullet point is one of the most important points to many of our colleagues at our hospitals. So I'll close with this last question and maybe hopefully leave you thinking about how T2 might be used at your hospital. Is might T2 help us then identify this missing 50%? This is another patient, a 73-year-old man at, at UPMC with ulcerative colitis, was admitted to our ICU with small bowel obstruction. He had many surgeries and extensive, uh, and extensive procedures that led to a hemicolectomy, among other things. He was clinically stable in our hospital until hospital day number eight when he developed, again, new fevers and hypotension. He got to our empiric cocktail of choice, cefepime, metronidazole, and vancomycin. And by hospital day 10, he had worsening sepsis and now required vasopressors. He had another X-lap and drainage of ascites, and they had to resect his abdominal wall, at which point they sent peritoneal fluid and tissue uh, for culture. On hospital day 11, he still wasn't any better and started on vasopressors. And at this point, the surgical team said, we're starting caspofungin. This guy looks sick. So blood cultures and T2 were ordered per protocol for this gentleman in November. And T2 was reported back in a handful of hours as positive for Canada albicans and tropicalis here. And blood cultures, after five days, grew nothing. So this is one of these discordant cases of T2-positive blood culture negative disease. So now what? We know that a T2-positive in this setting gives a very high pro pro positive predictive value. So do we leave him on caspofungin? Can we give him a short course, or can we stop it? Well, we got more data a few days later, because his peritoneal and tissue cultures also grew candida albicans. So this is one of those patients with deep-seated candidiasis, negative blood cultures, but T2 identified it, and fortunately, in this case, we had peritoneal and tissue cultures that identified the bug as well. So perhaps T2 can help us identify some of this missing 50%. And I think we need to think pragmatically about how we implement this test in very complicated patients. So I'll conclude by saying this. I think T2 is a very useful adjunct to blood cultures for the diagnosis of invasive candidiasis. And we've used it successfully at our center to guide antifungal treatment. 
I think T2 also has a very important role in predicting patient outcomes, and this might also be important for helping us identify which patients need shorter courses of antifungal therapy, and perhaps T2 can help us identify this missing 50%. But the most important thing is to take these data back to your hospital and understand your local epidemiology and which patients are at risk at your hospital. It may not be abdominal surgery patients, it may be oncology patients or other patients at your hospital, but if you know something about their pretest likelihood of disease, how likely are they to have candidiasis, you can use a test like this to better inform antifungal therapy, uh, and I think that's an important strategy that helps all of our patients. So with that, I thank you for your time and attention, and I think we'll have time for questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Next, we're going to bring up Emily Wise. She's a clinical infectious disease pharmacist at the Lee Health Community Health System, and she's going to discuss the incorporation of T2 bacteria testing in patients with sepsis using a stewardship approach. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Dr. Doss. I think my title is probably a little bit shorter, so I probably could have handled that one. <laughs> but good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming in today. As Dr. Shields discussed utilization of the T2 Canada panel, for this portion of the presentation this morning, I'd like to focus our discussion on incorporating the T2 bacteria panel into our antimicrobial decision-making pathway and how we can use the results from the T2 bacteria to guide antimicrobial stewardship in our sepsis patients. I'd also like to share with you some of the experiences that we've had using the T2 bacteria panel at Lee Health. So universally, there is this sense of urgency that surrounds a sepsis diagnosis or a suspicion of sepsis and septic shock. And that really stems from the high degree of morbidity and the high rate of mortality that we see with a sepsis diagnosis. And throughout the literature, one of the most consistent drivers of this high mortality rate is the delay in initiation of appropriate antibiotics. This was well demonstrated in a study published in 2006 that we often like to cite by Kumar et al. And researchers in this study showed that there was a 7.6% decrease in survival for every hour that appropriate antibiotics were delayed. So from this study, we know that effective early therapy really improves the survival of our patients. However, ensuring the effectiveness of that therapy early can be challenging, uh, particularly now in a period where we're seeing increasing emergence of multidrug-resistant organisms and decreasing susceptibilities to our commonly used antibiotics. And clinically, we're still feeling the challenges of ensuring this effectiveness. In 2014, there was a study that came out of patients uh, who were evaluated in the emergency department, and researchers here found that of patients who were admitted in the emergency department and received uh, antibiotics early, 10% of them that had a confirmed culture-positive infection did not receive an empiric regimen that effectively covered their infecting organism, and that ineffective coverage was associated with a 25% mortality rate. So we do have to ask ourselves, why is ensuring early effective therapy so challenging? And one of the biggest reasons we find for this, and to echo some of the uh, points that were discussed earlier, is because of the limitations that we see in our currently available tools in the microbiology lab. So blood cultures will always be our gold standard for identifying organisms in the microbiology lab. However, their early impact and utility is really limited by their uh, time required to identify a positive culture, but also by their overall sensitivity. As Dr. Shields mentioned earlier, uh, blood cultures can require at least 24 to 48 hours to trigger a positive and then can require even additional time to give us an organism ID. Additionally, some studies have shown that blood culture sensitivity can be as low as 65%, and this can correlate to about 50% of patients having a culture negative sepsis when they present to us. And this can be particularly challenging when we're trying to ensure therapy effectiveness or even target and de-escalate our antibiotics in our sepsis patients. We do have several rapid diagnostic technologies that have significantly improved our ability to identify an organism earlier. However, a majority of these platforms are still subject or still require a positive blood culture prior to use, so they're still subject to the inherent limitations that we see with blood cultures. So in the absence of early, highly sensitive blood cultures, oftentimes clinically we see that our broad spectrum empiric antibiotics are continued for an extended duration of time. Uh, and as we know, by overutilizing our broad spectrum antibiotics, perhaps unnecessarily, we do see some unintended consequences. Uh, and as stewards here, we all know that some of the biggest unintended outcomes with overutilizing our broad spectrum antibiotics is the development of multidrug resistance and the emergence of treatment-related adverse effects. 
To highlight some of the studies that have been published recently, in 2019, earlier this year, uh, Tishom et al. found with an adjusted hazards ratio of 1.04 that each additional day of anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam therapy increased a patient's risk of developing new resistance later on in their stay. And in 2018, Sedna et al. found that the, uh, greater than 48 hours of anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam therapy was an independent risk factor for the development of Clostridioides difficile infection. So while these two studies highlight anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam therapy in particular, we see the same kinds of risks with our uh, broad-spectrum gram-positive agents and our other broad-spectrum gram-negative agents. And I'm sure many of you have seen these outcomes at your institutions where patients will develop Clostridioides difficile while on broad-spectrum antibiotics or as you're looking at your antibiogram susceptibilities decreasing from year to year. So clearly, we know what we need to do to manage, to manage our sepsis patients, but there is still a gap in ensuring early effective therapy and protecting our broad-spectrum antimicrobials. And this is where T2 can really fit and help us strike that balance between those two needs. So T2 Biosystems uh, employs culture-independent testing, which allows us to bypass the need for a positive blood culture before we uh, analyze these samples. There are currently two FDA-approved panels through T2 that are available, the T2 Canada panel, which we uh, just discussed, and more recently approved in 2018 is the uh, T2 Bacteria panel. So the T2 Bacteria panel has been shown to provide us organism identification in an average of five and a half hours, and it can de detect growth as low as one CFU per ml. The T2 bacteria panel that's been approved for use in the United States identifies five of the escape pathogens that we have implicated in about 50 to 70 percent of our sepsis presentations. Regarding gram-positive bacteria, uh, the panel uh, identifies Enterococcus facium and Staphylococcus aureus, and regarding gram-negative bacteria, the panel detects Klebsiella pneumoniae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Escherichia coli. You'll also note that Acinetobacter baumannii is listed on this presentation, and I bring that up because at the time that we brought the T2 bacteria panel into Lee Health for a research use only basis, the research use only panel did include Acinetobacter, so you may hear me discuss it a little bit as we move on. But previous analyses have shown that the T2 bacteria panel has a sensitivity and specificity of around 95 and 98 percent respe respectively, and this correlates to a high negative predictive value of about 99 percent. So recognizing that the high sensitivity and high specificity of the test, as well as the need to bypass uh, positive blood cultures, could have significant implications for our patients who come in with sepsis, we decided to bring the T2 bacteria panel into Lee Health to see where exactly this fit in our decision-making pathway. So that was the exact purpose of our study when we incorporated the T2 bacteria panel into our emergency department, was to evaluate and understand the potential utility of the T2 bacteria panel in optimizing antibiotic therapy in our sepsis patients, but also in in guiding overall antimicrobial stewardship. Lee Health is a, a large community health system that's actually located just down the road from here in Fort Myers and Cape Coral, uh, Florida. We have four acute care adult hospitals and one freestanding pediatric hospital. And we conducted our T2 bacteria trial in our uh, flagship hospital, T uh, Lee Memorial, and we conducted it primarily in the emergency department. The primary outcome of our study was to evaluate the time to organism identification using the T2 bacteria panel and to compare that to the time required to identify organisms using standard blood cultures. Secondarily, we also wanted to evaluate the percent agreement between the T2 bacteria panel findings with the blood culture results. And then finally, we also wanted to evaluate the total number of potential interventions that could have been implemented uh, in response to the T2 bacteria results, and this includes both de-escalation and escalation opportunities. As I mentioned, this was a single center study. We evaluated patients prospectively, and it was designed as an observational study. So any interventions were recorded as potential interventions and not uh, acutely uh, implemented. Our patients were enrolled from the emergency department beginning in November of 2017 through March of 2018 when the T2 panel obtained FDA approval, and we did obtain informed consent from all of our patients or their representatives prior to enrolling them in the study. <clears throat> Included in the study, we wanted to target those patients who were high risk uh, and likely to have sepsis. So, so we would, uh, included patients who were admitted in the emergency department that had a confirmed diagnosis or a clinical suspicion of sepsis, and those who had a national early warning score or news score greater than or equal to seven, or one or more red scores. Or we included patients who had the sepsis diagnosis and had a news score greater than or equal to five, or a red score with a diagnosis of neutropenic fever. Uh, for reference, the new score is still fairly new, so I wanted to provide this here. Uh, the new score was an uh, assessment uh, uh, 
guide that was created by the Royal College of Physicians. And what it does is it assesses acute changes in the patient's physiological status. So it assesses various parameters like their respiration rate, oxygen saturation, temperature, blood pressure, et cetera. And the uh, larger variation that a patient has from a normal physiological parameter, the larger score they're assigned. And then based on the patient's aggregate score, we can determine their overall risk for clinical deterioration. Uh, so on the right-hand side, you can see that a low score uh, means that the patient has a low risk for clinical deterioration, while an aggregate score greater than or equal to 7 signifies a high risk. At Lee Health, we had just started to utilize the new score in our emergency department, so that's why we included it as a parameter for inclusion. Excluded from our study were those patients who were considered to be vulnerable populations, as well as those who had received long-term uh, IV therapy prior to admission, and importantly, those patients who had an invalid or indeterminate T2 bacteria result. Because we were implementing a new technology, there was some extensive education that we had to conduct prior to starting our study with the T2 bacteria panel. So we provided staff education to nurses, pharmacists, and physicians in the emergency department who were going to be involved with either collecting the samples or conducting patient enrollment. This was primarily a pharmacist-driven protocol, so all screening, enrollment, and consent was obtained by a protocol-trained pharmacist who resided primarily in the emergency department. After we obtained consent, blood cultures and the T2 bacteria sample were obtained concurrently from the patient, and once uh, obtained, the T2 bacteria sample was delivered to our on-site T2DX instrument, and our blood cultures were delivered to our microbiology lab. Once the T2 results became available, the protocol-trained pharmacist would interpret these results and compare them to the patient's empiric antibiotic regimen. And all results that suggested that antibiotic de-escalation could be implemented were recorded as potential interventions. And we also evaluated it and found that if organisms that were identified on the T2 bacteria were not covered by the patient's empiric antibiotic regimen, we did communicate this to the physician. We didn't recommend any active intervention, but ethically we felt that we should report those results to our physicians. So 28 samples or 28 patients were enrolled in our study. We did exclude five, uh, which left us 23 samples or 23 patients to include in our final evaluation. On average, patients were in their mid-60s and a majority of the patients that we enrolled were male. Our median new score was around nine with a range of seven to 12. And we also evaluated the most common reasons for antibiotic initiation or the most commonly suspected source of sepsis. And not unsurprisingly, we found that a majority of our patients, about 43%, had uh, been classified as having an undefined source of sepsis. Regarding our primary outcome, we found that overall T2 bacteria provided us results much faster than blood cultures. Looking at patients who had positive T2 results, T2 bacteria identified organisms in an average of 3.8 hours compared to blood cultures which provided us with a species identification in about 24 hours. So here we used initial species identification as our point of comparison rather than first initial positive gram stain because we felt that clinically at this point, this is the time when you start to make definitive decisions to adjust a patient's antimicrobial regimen. So uh, looking at this, the T2 bacteria panel provided us results approximately 20 hours sooner than the blood cultures. In patients who had negative results, the T2 bacteria provided us a final negative in about 3.7 hours compared to blood cultures which required an average of 126 hours or so or about five days to finalize a negative culture. And here we use the final neg negative rather than an initial negative as our point of comparison because our providers uh, regarding negative cultures like to wait until those cultures are finalized before de-escalating antibiotics. So this is the point at which we see antibiotic regimens being adjusted. Uh, so here, the difference, T2 bacteria panel provided us final negative results approximately 123 hours sooner than blood cultures. Uh, and with both of these, both the positive and negative results, we consider these to be very significant, uh, clinically significant differences. In addition to the time required to identify uh, species, we also wanted to evaluate how much the T2 bacteria panel compared uh, from an organism identification standpoint to the blood cultures. So there were 11 patients in our study out of the 23 that, has an, that had an organism positively identified on either the T2 bacteria panel or the blood cultures, and those are the patients I'll go through here on this slide. The remaining 12 patients did have concordant negative results between both the T2 bacteria panel and the blood cultures. So we saw that out of the 11 patients, three of them had complete agreement between T2 bacteria panel and blood culture results. Interestingly, all three of these patients identified Staphylococcus aureus, but these were the three patients where we had complete agreement. There were two patients where we saw partial agreement between the T2 bacteria results and blood cultures. Here, the T2 bacteria panel identified two organisms, while blood cultures only identified one. 
And one of our patients, T2 bacteria panel, uh, identified Staphylococcus aureus as well as Acinetobacter, and the blood cultures identified only Staph aureus. In our second patient, the T2 bacteria panel identified E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae, while blood cultures identified only E. coli. In the remaining six patients who had a positive culture, we, did not, we saw a disagreement between the T2 bacteria results and the uh, blood culture results. In three patients, uh, the T2 bacteria panel identified either E. coli or Pseudomonas, while the blood culture remained completely negative. And then in the remaining three patients, blood cultures identified either Staph epidermidis, the Staph parasanguinis, or Strep anginosis, while the blood culture, or excuse me, while the T2 bacteria panel remained negative. So to evaluate these outcomes as a whole, if you consider the uh, bacteria that are included on the uh, T2 bacteria panel, the T2 panel identified everything that the blood cultures were able to identify, plus uh, five additional organisms. Conversely, blood cultures only identified 50% of those identified by the T2 bacteria panel. They did identify a few additional species, the staph and strep species, but some of these were found to be one out of two blood culture positives, so could be arguably contaminants and not pathogens. Considering these results, we found that there were a total of 37 opportunities for interventions. 36 of these were opportunities for de-escalation, and de-escalation opportunities were considered uh, in consideration of the T2 bacteria results, but also in consideration of the patient's overall status, their history, their antibiotic exposure in the past, and our local antibiogram data to really determine if the de-escalation was appropriate. And a primary number of our de-escalation opportunities were on de-escalating anti-MRSA therapy or anti-pseudomonal therapy if either Staph aureus or Pseudomonas were not detected on the T2 bacteria panel. And we felt that these were some of the most clinically relevant interventions because most of our patients who come in with a sepsis diagnosis are started and continued for long-term on anti-MRSA or anti-pseudomonal therapy. We were also uh, able to observe antibiotic escalation in one patient, and that was the patient who uh, was found to have acinetobacter on their T2 bacteria panel and not on their blood culture. We communicated this to the physician, and the physician felt confident that the patient's empiric regimen did not effectively cover for this bacteria, so they escalated therapy as a precaution. I do want to mention uh, that we collected our T2 bacteria panel under ideal conditions, meaning we delivered it directly to our T2 instrument after we collected it in the emergency department. And with the ever-changing and exciting environment in the emergency department, this isn't always going to be possible. However, the difference in time to result between the blood cultures and the T2 bacteria panel was still large enough that we felt even under non-perfect circumstances, the findings would still be very significant. So in conclusion at this study, uh, we at, T at Lee Health determined that with use of the culture-independent testing and use of the T2 bacteria panel, final results were available in four hours, which was uh, significantly different than what we saw with blood culture results. And the T2 bacteria panel was able to provide us identification on a greater number of pathogens than the blood cultures were. And because of the high sensitivity and high specificity of the test, we felt that our potential interventions would be clinically actionable. So we found numerous opportunities for antimicrobial stewardship in our sepsis patients based on our findings from this study. To exemplify how we would incorporate the T2 bacteria panel and the findings into antimicrobial stewardship, I'd like to share with you one of the patients that we identified through our uh, trial. And this was a 62-year-old female who had a history of breast cancer and was actively receiving chemotherapy. Before she came to our hospital, she had just previously received chemotherapy approximately five days prior. When she presented to the emergency department, she had complaints of weakness, urinary retention, uh, transient fever and chills, and also complained of GI symptoms to include nausea and diarrhea. Empirically, she was initiated on cepapime and vancomycin for uh, suspicion of sepsis and febrile neutropenia, and after we enrolled her in our study, we sent off blood cultures and T2 samples, and within approximately four hours, the T2 panel, panel came back positive for Staphylococcus aureus. The patient was continued on cefepime and vancomycin until day two when blood cultures resulted positive for methicillin-sensitive Staphylococcus aureus. And then also because of her uh, GI symptoms, she was tested and tested positive for Clostridioides difficile. At this point in time, because of the blood culture results, uh, the treating team uh, opted to change the patient from cefepime and vancomycin to piperacillin tazobactam monotherapy. And they adjusted to monotherapy to provide coverage of MSSA, but also because since the blood cultures were not finalized, they wanted to continue covering for uh, empiric coverage of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, and then moving on into day five and day six, the patient was actually adjusted to nafcillin monotherapy. 
At this point in time, the blood cultures became, or finalized as being negative, so they only showed Staphylococcus aureus and not Pseudomonas aeruginosa, so they felt comfortable de-escalating therapy to nafcillin monotherapy, which was timely because her TE was also positive for a vegetation at this point. So looking at how T2 bacteria may have made a difference in this patient's therapy, the T2 bacteria provided us a final positive result for uh, Staphylococcus aureus four hours after we sent the sample for testing. We also had a final negative for Pseudomonas aeruginosa within the same time frame window. So ideally, the T2 bacteria could have helped us optimize therapy and get the patient off of anti-pseudomonal empiric therapy and more targeted MSA, MSSA therapy earlier. And in doing so, we could have earlier uh, optimized our patient's therapy and gotten her on preferred treatment for MSSA bacteremia. We could have gotten her on a more narrow spectrum agent in consideration of her concomitant infection with Clostridioides difficile infection. And then, uh, especially important in this patient who uh, was a neutropenic fever patient and would likely be exposed to broad spectrum antibiotics in the future, we could have limited her exposure to anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam beta therapy on this admission and prevented or tried to prevent the emergence of resistance in the future. So I hope that highlights how we can incorporate the T2 bacteria panel into our patient workup and antimicrobial decision making. I'd like to sort of summarize by just showing you the available T2 uh, panels that we have at our disposal. So we've discussed the T2 bacteria panel and the T2 Canada panel, uh, but upcoming, perhaps on a research use only basis, we see the uh, T2 Canada ORIS panel. And also interesting uh, to consider in conjunction with the T2 bacteria panel is the T2 resistance panel. Uh, this panel identifies several resistant markers that we see in our gram-positive organisms, as well as several resistant markers that we see in our gram-negative uh, organisms. And these include markers for both ESBLs and carbapenemases. So I'll just summarize by saying that uh, the T2 bacteria panel does provide us with faster results. And as was echoed earlier, it should be used as an adjunctive therapy to blood cultures in our currently, rapid, uh, currently available rapid diagnostic technology. Uh, but it fits perfectly in our clinical decision making to help us achieve that balance between effective early therapy and protecting our broad spectrum antimicrobials. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I think we'll have time for questions here, but I'll go ahead and pass it back to Dr. Goff. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Emily. We'll actually take questions with our panel at the end, so we'll uh, hold those. All right, our last speaker is Sandy Estrada. Sandy was the clinical pharmacist at uh, Lee Health for many years and actually implemented T2 there while she was a clinician. Emily was her resident, and so it's always great to see such a success. Um, thank you, Emily, for a wonderful presentation and a great study also. So Sandy is going to talk to us about while she was there, what does it take to get these into your healthcare system? Um, so she actually was the one who accomplished that. So Sandy, she is currently now with T2 as the uh, Vice President of Medical Affairs. So with that, I'd like to welcome Sandy. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you to uh, Ryan and Emily for sharing some of the exciting data that they've both seen from their institutions with the implementation of T2. So really to wrap everything up today, you've seen a lot of great data. I don't have any additional data to share with you, but I want to share with you some information on the practical implementation of this type of technology. And so uh, the title of From Interest to Implementation, designed specifically because I know that many times I myself and probably several of you have sat in a room like this and heard very exciting data about something new that's out there. But you're maybe thinking, well, Ryan can do that at UPMC because he has a diagnostic stewardship team or he's at an academic medical center or you know, Emily can do that because she's at this type of institution that you know, already had T2 Canada, then they could implement bacteria. And so I kind of want to give you a more overarching uh, thought process on how to successfully go from, wow, this is really exciting, to let's actually do this in my patient population. So a little bit more about my story. As Debbie mentioned, I joined Lee Health as the infectious diseases clinical pharmacist in 2004. Interestingly enough, the same year that bad bugs, no drugs, uh, kind of started to become uh, one of the hot topics. And so really I finished residency at a time where it was starting to become highlighted that we didn't have enough antibiotics 
And so as, as years progressed, then five years later, we had the bad bugs, no drugs, no escape. And so really then followed by the call, uh, the 10 by 20, so the call for 10 new uh, antimicrobials to be developed by 2020. Well, guess what? Here we are in 2019. And so these years have, have flown by. And so we recognized really along the same timeline at Lee Health that we need to do something different other than just wait for new antibiotics. And we thought the right thing to do was to utilize our antibiotics better by diagnosing our patients faster. And so I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to bring in several different rapid diagnostic platforms um, over the years and really participate in the excitement of starting off with saying, okay, we could get that blood culture that was positive and then identify a species very quickly and then move into the T2 technology, which was allowing us now to get a species ID before we even had a blood culture. So how did we do this and how can you do this? And so I think there's three key steps to successful rapid diagnostic, test, diagnostic testing implementation. The first is planning, the second is implementing, and the third is evaluating. And if you're missing any of these key steps, then you may struggle along the way uh, in your process. So we'll talk about each one of these a little bit more and what's required in, in each one of these steps. So first of all, plan and collaborate. And I wanna to try to give you an example for each one of these so we're not talking in the hypothetical, but we're talking in the, again, what do we actually experience at our institution? So planning and collaborating. First of all, and this is T2 bacteria example. So Emily shared the data from Lee Health, but how did we get to that point? How did we decide that we wanted to do that study? How did our doctors decide that they wanted this information? How did our lab decide they wanted to run this test? How did we decide that we were actually willing to be in the ER and kind of help through some of the logistics of it? So we asked some questions. How do we currently identify sepsis patients in the emergency department? What are we using for empiric therapy for sepsis? And are we happy with where we're at? And so the answers to these questions helped us understand the problem that we had and that many of you may have. First of all, sepsis order sets updates had actually led to increased antibiotic utilization. We had concern about ESBL producing organisms, resistance, and so we had started using increased carbapenems in patients suspected of sepsis, and it was a significant concern for our stewardship program at that point in time. Bencomycin and piperacillin tazo empiric therapy was still a problem really felt like there was an overuse of antibiotics many times for five to seven days in patients that had culture negative sepsis and we couldn't de-escalate. And so those were the problems that we identified as the answers to our question. And then you've identified your problems, collect some baseline data to have so that when you implement an intervention, you can make a comparison of how well you've done. And I'll give you a hint. Collecting baseline data sometimes sounds like a lot of work. You don't have time to do that. Maybe you don't have students or residents or other colleagues that are right at, at your fingertips to help with these things. You may already have the data, especially in the sepsis patient population. Every hospital has some kind of sepsis bundles, some kind of septic sepsis metrics that are being collected. So work with your quality improvement department. Work outside of the pharmacy. This is where the collaborate part comes in. Don't take it all on by yourself and see what do you have. Get your number of sepsis admissions. Uh, get your number of sepsis order sets that you're using. Are all of these patients getting broad spectrum antibiotics? How fast are they getting them? And how effective are they? And most of this is information you don't really have to go collect. You just have to get it from someone who already collected it. And I'd love to talk to any of you more later about the specifics of, of how we did that. For T2 Candida, we did a similar process. So when we first heard about T2 Candida, we reviewed some of the literature that Ryan presented earlier, and we thought, wow, T2 Candida has a really high mortality rate, but we don't think it's that bad in our hospital. So let's take a look at a subset of patients. And so we quickly looked, uh, we had found about 77 patients who had been positive for candidemia by blood culture over about a year timeline. We had about 59 of them that we were actually able to evaluate for only two things. How long did it take to get them on appropriate therapy? And what was the mortality rate? So again, not a complex data collection process. Wasn't something we were looking to publish, just something to see where are we at, a snapshot in our patient population. And we found that on average, it took us 39 hours to get treatment initiation on these patients. And our mortality rate was 36%, right in line with what was published in all the previous work. So we did, in fact, have a bigger problem than we realized we had because we had never asked the question before. 
So we asked the question to ourselves, what can we do to reduce, reduce the time to appropriate antifungal therapy? And that was really what led us to implement T2 Candida at our institution. And this is powerful data when talking to hospital administrations saying we need to bring in a new test. You know, is it, is it good enough that it's taking um, almost two days to get a patient on appropriate therapy? The clear answer is no, it's not good enough. We need to do better. So back to collaborating within your institution. Don't try to do it alone. Lab, pharmacy, nursing, physicians, we're all there to be in it together. We all have a different role to play, but slightly overlapping. Make sure you get your team together early and make sure that you have your team available to help you every step of the way. But also, don't just think about within your institution. Think about outside the institution. As we've all learned here at MADID, collaborators and mentors are everywhere. And they're everywhere in this room. So who has gone before? Who has already implemented T2? Would Ryan be able to help you with an algorithm for T2 Canada in your ICU? I'm going to volunteer that, that he probably would. would. Would Emily be able to share her processes from, from Lee Health for T2 bacteria? Of course, we're all willing to help each other. Um, so get those examples from other institutions. Don't feel like you have to start from zero. Specifically, cost justifications and clinical algorithms. As stewardship pharmacists, these are some of the two things that we struggle the most with on how to put together. And so get an example and then put your data into it, put your patient population into it, tweak it to make it fit your institution, but it can help you get it done in a much faster timeline than if you're starting from zero. Finally, as part of planning and collaborating, define your metrics for success. What do you want to do? So there's all kinds of things you can look at. We've seen some of these outcomes presented here today. Antibiotic days of therapy, time to effective therapy, time to optimal therapy, big difference in the, in the sepsis world the cost savings that can be associated with some of these things, and then some of our more clinical outcomes like length of stay or other things that we may want to look at. Um, mortality is something that many times we're not going to see in a small single center study, but it's still something that we want to pay attention to in our patient population, and toxicity of antibiotics. Also, we can't even put a cost on a patient developing C. difficile. I mean, we have tried, right? And we know that the cost of one patient developing C. difficile would cover probably six months of testing patients. And so that's a really important thing to bring up when we're talking about cost justifications. But remember, why did you start? When you're picking your metric, you don't need to pick the same metric that another institution picked. Pick the metric that's most important to you. Why did you collect that data in the beginning? So for us at Lee Health with T2 Canada, it was time to appropriate therapy. That was the one thing we really wanted to evaluate, and we focused on that. With T2 bacteria, it was stewardship opportunities to escalate or de-escalate. And so we felt we had an overuse of antibiotics. We wanted to see, could we change that? And so that was our main metric, because that was most important in our institution. So the next phase is educate and implement. You've defined your problem. You've defined that this new test can help to solve your problem and now you're ready to implement it. Education is the most important thing. And we all know, we've heard over and over again, that education alone does not help, but we also know that intervention without education is not good either. And so really, you're gonna define your algorithm. Who are you testing? How are you acting on your results? You're going to educate that, usually in a broad scale way. So at Lee Health, we did grand rounds type of presentations, educated all the stakeholders. This is what we're about to do. We had one page flyers, we had slides. We had things to hang on the floors to remind the nurses that we were collecting uh, this additional tube of blood for the testing. And then we implemented. And after we implemented, we found out right away, we needed to do more education. We needed to go back to the floors and do an in-service on a weekly basis for the first month or two of implementation until it started to become standard practice that we would actually do this additional test. After we do that, additional education that's more in the moment, less formal, Education also, when we call a provider with a result, that's education. Hey, as a reminder, we have T2 Candida now. This is a direct from whole blood assay that's going to give us the following information. And according to our protocol, we recommend the following changes to antifungal therapy. Have a checkpoint. Don't wait until the end of the year or some extensive amount of time to find out that maybe things aren't going exactly the way you wanted them to go. Have frequent and early checkpoints and you may need to go back and redefine your algorithm a little bit. Maybe you found there's another patient population that should be tested. Maybe you found that you need a tweak to the recommendations that you're making. And so it's basically part of a, a continuous process of redefining, educating, 
implementing or re-implementing and doing it uh, continuously. Even four years into using something new, we should still be evaluating where we're at, how it's working, and do we need to change anything. So going back to the T2 Canada example for education, again, we had the four key stakeholder groups. So nursing and phlebotomy, lab, pharmacy, and physicians. And so each one had a slightly different focus for what we had to educate. For nursing and phlebotomy, the focus was how to obtain the sample. For lab, of course, it was the instrument, how to run the test. For pharmacy, who should be tested because we're collaborating with the physicians on that part and how to interpret the results for both pharmacy and physicians. But notice the second bullet point or third bullet point under every one of these, the value of the test. This is something we learned. In the beginning, we focused more on the value of the test with the physicians, but we didn't focus as much with the other stakeholders. And so with nursing, we were trying to say, okay, we're kind of struggling with remember to collect the T2. When we came back and did our second educational initiative and we explained the value of the test, and we explained that it was taking two days for people in our institution to get on an appropriate antifungal, and now we are going to do it in four hours, they were excited. They wanted to go do T2 on more patients. And so we really learned that even though the nurse isn't the one ordering the T2, even though the phlebotomist isn't the one ordering the T2, everybody needs to understand why we're choosing to do something that may at first glance look like more work, but it's actually going to make such a big difference for a small amount of work. Once you explain it, then they're completely bought in and actually helped us become successful. We've mentioned algorithms today. This is just another example of an algorithm that's been developed for looking at a T2 bacteria negative patient. So many physicians initially will, pharmacists as well, will look at, at a result and say, I want a positive result. It's fairly obvious what we'll do. We'll optimize therapy and we'll get them on the right drug. But if it's negative, well, we'll wait for the blood culture and, and kind of see what to do next. And so as Emily discussed, there's actually a lot of opportunities for intervention with a negative test. Because these patients are on empiric therapy, we can evaluate, do they need to remain on coverage for Staph aureus when Staph aureus is negative? Do they need to remain on coverage for Pseudomonas when Pseudomonas is negative? Or would we perhaps narrow their antibiotics based on the source of infection? If it's an intra-abdominal infection, Staph aureus negative, Pseudomonas negative, we may go from a vancomycin piptazo to a ceftriaxone metronidazole, as an example. And these are the types of interventions, again, um, in, in other cases that were seen um, through the Lee Health study, as well as we've seen um, through other institutions that have implemented T2 bacteria. So finally, after you have done your planning and you're collaborating, you've done your implementation and your education, now it's time to evaluate and share. And so another former resident, uh, Megan Patch, in the room, actually implemented T2 Canada as part of her residency project and was able to get her data published, which was shared uh, in part earlier by Ryan. And so celebrate your successes. And it doesn't always have to be in a publication. It can be simply sharing exciting cases. Again, how you show the value of what you're doing. Go share the, with those nurses how you got someone on appropriate therapy faster or how you got a C. difficile patient off of antibiotics that were potentially going to be more toxic to them. And that builds a lot of excitement in your institution. So don't forget your own institution. And, and sometimes we get excited to publish something, right? But we also need to go back and share this data with our own institution as well as outside of our institution. And so I'll leave you with my top 10 list of things you can do to successfully implement um, T2 at your institution. So first of all, assemble a team. Make sure you have all the key stakeholders there. Second of all, collaborate beyond your internal team. Remember to talk to your other colleagues, your mentors, other institutions that have gone before. Remember to ask the questions and understand the problem and the solution. Don't jump right in. Take a little bit of time to plan and everything will go so much more smoothly. Collect your baseline data, but before you start collecting, remember to check, did somebody else already collect it? And maybe you already have access to it, you just need to look at it and evaluate it. Define your metrics. What is the most important thing that you hope to get out of this, and how will you collect that data? Develop an algorithm, or work with your colleagues from another institution to obtain an algorithm for the implementation, and take the time to educate. Educate some more before after and in those initial early days, continue education as much as you can. Use your electronic health record. We didn't focus on this today, but use these tools that we have as a resource. We used Epic 
as part of our way to identify patients for T2 bacteria because the new score was right there, automatically calculated for us. We didn't have to calculate it by hand. So use a tool that you already have available to you to help in your patients. Patient selection process. Have frequent checkpoints. Make sure things are going well. If they aren't, regroup. And at the end, you can share your successes, but also share your challenges. Share that you had to have a frequent checkpoint. In our situation, we had to realize that we needed to do a better job of education, helping our nurses understand the value, for example, and really getting everybody on the same team. And so that was a challenge that we had that nobody else needs to have, because now we can share that um, with others. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And I think we will have the panel come back up. <laughs>